Hello, my name is Catherine Heinemeyer. I'm, um, I'm based in the Institute for Social Justice at York St. John University. Thanks very much to Lee Higgins for inviting me to give you this short introductory talk, exploring some ways of, of linking community music and ecological justice in preparation for your winter school that's coming up that I'll be greatly looking forward to joining you at. So um, really to start with a quick look at what this concept of ecological justice is. And it's been defined, obviously, in a lot of different ways. You notice it's not the term environmental justice. It's not the term sustainable development. Ecological justice is trying to point us to certain concerns. Miranda and Burma will say ecological justice hopes to address not just environmental issues, but the myriad social problems that underpin environmental inequities. So what we're looking at is how climate change and ecological degradation are multiplying existing inequalities, existing challenges and oppressions that people are facing in their lives. You might have seen some kind of version of this, um, this drawing or this metaphor um, expressing the idea that we're all in the same storm of climate change, of, of ecological crisis, climate crisis, but we're in different boats. Some of us are in uh, great big comfortable yachts. Others are in huge, well-defended destroyers with the power to exclude others from them. Others are um, struggling and being buffeted by the waves in tiny little sailing boats and canoes. And um, so that's what ecological justice, to my mind, is looking at. And in my experience so far working with ecological justice in um, my own practice, which primarily I'm a storyteller, um, although I'm also a musician and I've quite a lot of uh, experience in community music settings myself, um, putting this concept of ecological justice into practice in also in research actually leads to quite simple questions that are easy for people to wrap their heads around. For example, who is suffering first and worst the impacts of climate change or climate degradation or environmental degradation. And what can we learn from these frontline communities? How are they adapting? How are they coping? How are they developing strategies for resilience? How do we support people and ecosystems to adapt? And how can our climate solutions or our environmental solutions tackle both the social and environmental facets of the problem at the same time? And how do our arts practices feed into those processes? So just to say something briefly about climate change and community arts, I'm actually not just community arts, I would say a lot of theatre, a lot of uh, musical practice seeking to engage with the idea of, of particularly the climate crisis, but also the environmental crisis. And actually, I think uh, theatre is more guilty or more, more struggling than music with, with what I'm about to lay out. And that is um, something that might be familiar to a lot of you, the idea that climate crisis is the quintessential hyper object. And the hyper object is Timothy Morton's uh, coinage in this book, um, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World. And a hyper object to Timothy Morton is something that is an entity of such vast temporal and spatial dimensions that it defeats traditional ideas about what a thing is in the first place. So the metaphor in the front cover there of the iceberg, um, it's already huge on the surface. And when we go underneath the surface, it's an immeasurably vast object that's reaching out into many areas of the sea. And it's, it's shaping the lives of sea and land creatures all around it. They're super complex global phenomena which interact with every other feature of human existence. And this means they're everywhere in everyone's lives. Climate change is everywhere in everyone's lives, but it makes it very hard to pin down. It makes it intrinsically unbounded. So Perpetua uh, Kirby and um, her colleague, somebody Webb, first name temporarily escaping me, um, looked at how education, for example, is engaging with climate change and how it's struggling with its very unbounded nature. It's not a thing that you can sort of fit into a PSHE lesson, fit into a geography lesson or a science lesson, because it's it's creeping out into people's lives in, in all sorts of different ways. So how do we engage with that? It's very difficult to make a show about climate change because it's um, in the way that you would perhaps a show about bullying or about racism in a certain community. You can try, you, you can try to make a show about the climate crisis and people do and people have made, um, you know, musical work about the climate crisis as a whole. Um, 
I think that when you do, you'll, you'll be, find yourself looking for a point of connection. And very often the point of connection you'd find if you're trying to deal with the entire climate crisis is something like, how can the people in this room make that problem stop? How can we stop climate change here in this room? Um, it, this picture is a bit grainy, but that there is me uh, about 10 or 15 years ago taking part in a, a collaborator's um, community music um, show project, Compost the Mini Musical, um, Annalisa Emmons-Dean, her name was. And we were making a, a mini musical with community members at a festival about how people should compost and how that will help reverse climate change and we were using compost bins as our drums now, this was great fun this was intergenerational um good crack in every way and i think this kind of work definitely has its role and um, it gives people a sort of a, an instant point of of um, purchase i guess on the climate crisis and how they can contribute but i think things have moved on quite a bit over the past decade or two the climate crisis is accelerating the average level of consciousness of just how serious this, these issues are, how they are um, affecting vulnerable people already in a, a great deal of a uh, number of ways means that some of these questions have moved on and that might not be where the, the center of balance of practice can be anymore. It can't, I don't think, all be about how individuals or small groups of people can somehow make it stop because people know that they can't. And this was from some research we did at York St John University, uh, my research group, um, with students about how they wanted their different curricula across different subjects to engage with ecological justice. And this one student said, I think that now like people already think it's too big of an issue to fix. I think it's going to be even harder to try and be like, yes, it's the entire world. You're all in the same boat. So we all need to help solve the thing. This student felt that that kind of discourse just wasn't believable anymore, that it was really more about um, what is already happening and how do we engage with that? So I'd like to talk for a little while about this project, Suitcase Stories, which is a community storytelling project, which um, together with colleagues here in the geography department and the drama department and the Institute for Social Justice here at York St. John, I've been involved with. And this research, uh, my end of it took place in a school called Batley Girls High School in Batley in West Yorkshire with a group of girls from primarily Muslim families. Um, it's a working class area of, of this town called Batley. Um, and we also did some work in community settings in Seacroft in Leeds. And this project attempted to take a different approach to using community arts to broach climate issues that starting from the point of view, starting from the realization that we already realize climate change is affecting young people in myriad ways and how could we engage with that? Um, we'll provide the links here. What I'd like you to do at the moment, I'd like, I'd like to invite you to pause the video now and go and have a look at our Suitcase Stories website. And embedded in that website um, is a 10 minute documentary about the project. And it's full of the young people's own voices, the teacher's voices, and it tells the story of the project uh, much better than I could do. So I'd like to invite you to pause now and watch that video. You'll also see on the website a couple of teaching resources that we put together for teachers to, uh, or, or drama or arts facilitators to run similar kind of projects in their own settings. So yes, please do pause the video and join me again when you have, when you've seen it. So as you'll have seen in that video, what we did was we started by exploring the issue of, of climate adaptation with young people. How are the questions, how, who is suffering, who is already experiencing the worst impacts of climate change? How, how are they adapting and how can we learn from that? And from there, we went to stories and we went to the, the young people hearing and, and interacting with firsthand stories from Nigerian young people, from a climate journalist, um, from our own uh, geographer expert Olalekan Adekola, uh, who is himself from Nigeria, from their own community, and then creating, based on what they'd learned, their own stories that, that started to work out possible solutions or work out possible futures or possible adaptations. And um, once they'd kind of established that real connection to how is climate change affecting them in their lives. So I want to just go back to Kirby and Webb for a moment, because what they advise, they're, they're working in an educational setting. They advise teachers 
to resist in relation to climate change to resist the temptation to offer young people pat solutions easy solutions or you know go and compost and and switch off the lights and recycle and everything will be fine resist that temptation rather make space for dissensus for the opposite of consensus for lots of opposing views lots of different experiences to find voice in classrooms be ready for to have those difficult conversations to i've highlighted this in for a reason you'll see in a minute to explore the diverse ways in which young people's lives intersect with the climate crisis explore that with them and to be comfortable with your own uncertainty around climate crisis your own complex emotions as an educator or as a music facilitator so if we want to start from the idea of exploring all the connections between the climate crisis ecological crisis and and our participants lives i've done a little mapping exercise here what are some of the relationships between those battly young people and the climate crisis ecological degradation well there are many they're experiencing rising food prices for reasons that are at least half to do with climate change and scarcity, um, drought, uh, water, soil degradation in different countries. That's going to be a major stress on their families this winter, this this year particularly. A lot of global and local economic uncertainty also linked in many ways to ecological degradation. They express that in terms of the shops closing down in their area, of there not being a lot of jobs in their area, um, of them not being sure what they might be able to go on to after they leave school. They talked a lot about the lack of green spaces, the fact that those that were were not very well loved, were very surveilled, they didn't feel very free in them. They talked about temperature extremes. They'd all experienced flooding, or their relatives had in Batley. Um, they'd experienced a very hot summer the year that we were working with them. And this winter, they'll experience a very cold winter and a lot of them in cold houses because of the fuel price rises. A lot of them had relatives in Pakistan or Africa and in some cases Australia, and they had a lot of anxiety about what those relatives would be experiencing in, in, because of the climate crisis. And that came out in sort of participatory drama games we did based on mapping. Um, in terms of religion and cultural identity, a lot of them expressed those, the, the mosque and the cultural centre, as being real centres of community resilience, where people look after each other and where people could help each other get through stuff. They talked about how the, the mosque had helped people after the floods. Um, on the other hand, their, their Muslim identity, they also expressed it placing restrictions on them, what they were allowed to do, who they were allowed to hang out with, what they were allowed to go to. A lot of them said they wouldn't be allowed to go to a climate protest, for example. Many of the girls frequently expressed, I would say, climate grief or, or anxiety about particularly about wildlife and special ecosystems that they had seen on TV or they'd read about um, or that their relatives had been to, but they felt they might never get to see in, a, in an intact form. So you, it's a hyper object. It's intersecting with their lives in numerous, numerous ways. And this was really evident when they started brainstorming questions they wanted to ask the Nigerian pupils they were linking with remotely. And um, this is the, the mapping of one group. Look, it's they were asked, what questions do you want to ask these, these kids your age in relation to uh, the environmental climate crisis? And they came up with such a range of things. And they're not just what you'd think. It's not just about uh, how do you deal with the warm and how is the government tackling the flooding? It's also how do you keep cool? Do you do school trips? Are there crimes in your area? For these girls, it was quite obvious that security and environmental concerns were linked. Do you get lost in the rainforests? So I'd like to invite you to pause again and do this kind of mapping exercise for the community group that you work with. What, what are the ways that the people in the room that you're making music with, how are their lives already intersecting with the climate crisis, with them? Um, with ecological crisis. So um, when you've done that, back to suitcase stories, we then started with those connections and then we provided containers. And the containers we provided for those, for all that range of feelings and connections was stories. We told the girls and gave them access to lots of stories, first, second and third hand, of how people in frontline communities are coping with climate change. So. They found a lot to chew on in my colleague Lekan's story of when he was a student not much older than them and it got so hot at night that he would, in Nigeria, he would have to soak his mattress in water and sleep on that on the veranda. That kept coming back in, that, that kind of sensory detail, that really uh, human experiential.
My apologies that I got cut off in mid-flow there. I'll carry on from where I left off. So the Batley students find a lot to chew on in Likan's story of how he and his friends in very hot weather in Nigeria growing up would actually soak their mattresses in water so as to be able to get a good night's sleep out on the veranda or in the yard. And it was this kind of sensory detail that really stuck with the girls and helped them um, start to have experiential ways in to understanding the climate crisis. We told them the story of Vivian Sansour and the Palestine Heritage Seed Library. Um, this is an incredible initiative in Palestine that's preserving um, old varieties of seed that are resilient to climate change and that also can grow in Palestinian soils without perhaps needing the same fertilizers and, and pesticide inputs because they, they have a natural resilience to them. And they're also building community resilience through that project by sharing these seeds with a sort of traveling kitchen from one village to another and sharing recipes and food culture and Palestinian culture and intergenerational knowledge in the process of doing so. And this story, I think, became absolutely crucial to the girls because they um, a lot of their improvisations picked up on this idea of passing seeds of knowledge from one generation down to the next and that being a big part of um, climate solutions for them. That was something that really struck us as surprisingly um, prevalent in, in all of their responses. We told them the true story of Hindu Umaru Ibrahim and the women of Lake Chad who are having to cope as Lake Chad uh, desiccates and shrinks and the area around it desertifies and how again indigenous knowledge um, led primarily by women while their husbands are often away looking for work elsewhere is a big part of the answer. So in so doing, in looking at at how global majority cultures are meeting the climate crisis. The girls gained curiosity about how their own home cultures were also creating um, solutions or contained the seeds of solutions. And finally, we told them the uh, the true story up here of William Kamkwamba, the Malawian teenager who, during a drought in Malawi um, in the early 2000s, actually managed to bring electricity through to his village through a sort of barefoot engineering approach, whereby he used materials from a dump to build a wind turbine to um, to bring electricity to his home and then later on to his school and wider village and true stories like this and also of the real difficulties faced by people in the global south trying to um, innovate solutions to the climate change to the climate crisis that are both about adapting and about mitigating the climate crisis these kind of challenges that people are facing the the persecution the lack of resources um the need to endure and persist, this became a really important theme for the girls as well. So each of these stories was providing them with different hooks or uh, emotional connections to the realities and the solutions to the climate crisis. And they then created their own stories in response. One group created the story of a shopkeeper in Batley in their own town whose grocery failed when a big chain store moved in nearby with discount prices. Um, and this seemed to be a really important theme for the girls, how their local economy was was flagging. But their story turned it into a community initiative whereby local people helped this woman set, turn her shop into an upcycling shop um, and regenerate the, the economy in that way. Um, another group, I obviously inspired by William Kamkwamba, uh, created the story of a Malawian teenager who helped stop flooding in her grandmother's village, who had gone to the city, but then came back to her grandmother's rural village and helped find solutions to uh, flooding and drought in the, uh, in the village through tree planting and digging irrigation channels. So again, you could, there was a sense of the of the girls working out solutions, playing them forward, using the stories they heard as, as research materials. And then finally, there was um, a story of a Brazilian indigenous girl who became a poet to express her grief and her anger at the way her forest home was being decimated, because not all of these solutions were practical solutions. Some of them were emotional responses. Some of them were ways that they could, as storytellers, as musicians, as communicators, as that they could bring their voices and contribute in that way to the crisis. So that was our example with suitcase stories. I just want to talk you through another example. And this was the reading that I suggested you might want to have a look at the grant 2019, which is about 
Vanuatu coastal communities. So I mapped the connections between Batley girls and the climate crisis. This is a, a music, explicitly music linked example where Vanuatu coastal communities are suffering ecological injustices in various ways. These are some of their connections, their cultural knowledge is very threatened, the, the, the transfer, the passing on of their cultural knowledge and their culture is being very threatened by the changes brought about by the climate crisis. Um, as their as their economy is is restructured, as people can't afford to live in the ways that they used to live, their incomes are fragile because um, the fish stocks are uh, are vulnerable, and they're excluded from national and global policy because they are indigenous people on on the remote edges of the global economy. So how can we map then how their how community music can help connect? Can, can make concrete these connections between um, this particular community and the climate crisis, the ecological crisis. Well, on the cultural knowledge front, community music, the water music of Etetung, where the women bash, you know, um, use the surface of the water, the surface tension of the water as a drum, it's called Etetung, is being used as a way of maintaining and transmitting cultural knowledge. On another level, it's also providing um, an income generation because people, uh, tourists are coming to watch people and learn from people how to do Etetung, how to play this music. And thirdly, Etetung performances are giving Vanuatu communities a voice in climate discourses. They're creating particular performances, special performances that uh, express their cultural knowledge about the climate crisis and their demands in relation to the climate crisis. So another mapping for you there. And really my final thought is that Community arts, what it can do better than anything else is provide a container, provide containers for people's complex issues, emotional responses and anxieties or fears about an issue and hopes about an issue. Um, the great, great storyteller Ursula Le Guin talked of stories as gourds. She says stories have tended to be considered like a spear, like something long and thin that goes from a problem at the beginning to a solution at the end in a straight line. And that's a, for her a quite masculine, even a quite warlike image. She says, let's instead think about stories as gourds, as containers. They can contain water or food, or they can contain what we've gathered. Well, maybe they can be containers for ideas. And she says, I would go so far as to say that the natural proper fitting shape of the novel might be that of a sack or a bag. A book holds words. Words hold things, they bear meanings. A novel is a medicine bundle holding things in a particular powerful relation to one another and to us. So I guess that's my my question to you. Our container in the Suitcase Stories project was the suitcase, but you can provide musical gourds for your participants um, as, uh, as the etitung becomes in that grant article. And in a sense, your case study is um, is this zero waste library, this uh, very sustainable library. Well, a library is in a sense already a container and a book is already a container for ideas. Several of the stories I mentioned that we provided to the uh, young people in the Suitcase Stories Project involved books and and um, and libraries. In fact, William Kamkwamba went to his local library to find an engineering textbook which had a picture of a windmill and that's what enabled him to um, make his windmill and the Palestine Heritage, Palestine Heritage Seed Library is a library. So with this library, it's already a container. What can you bring into it? So I guess really to sum up my, my uh, two-stage model for working in community arts with the climate crisis, one that I'm working with, experimenting with in my own mind anyway, is first of all to map the existing connections of this community to the climate and ecological crisis and to ecological justice. And then it's to choose a starting point on that map. Where are we going to start to, to, uh, to explore? And then it's to provide a container for that exploration, a metaphor, a device, a suitcase, a gourd, a way of making music together. So I really look forward to taking part in your discussions on what those connections are and what those containers could be. There are some references for you. <laughs>